Okay, welcome everyone. And thank you for coming to the um, second to the last uh, Lunch and Learn for the spring semester of uh, 2021. My name is Carl Teichman. I'm Director of Government and Community Relations with Illinois Wesleyan. Uh, and it's my uh, pleasure to introduce a colleague, uh, Franklin Lari, who is our Director of the School of Music at Illinois Wesleyan. Um, uh, Franklin has a doctorate from the University of uh, Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. Um, Franklin originally hails from South Africa. Um, prior to coming to uh, Illinois Wesleyan, uh, Franklin uh, previously served as the director of the South African College of Music at the University of Cape Town, uh, where he was also the uh, professor of piano. Um, Franklin uh, has a, uh, a uh, research interest in Brahms, uh, which uh, he's going to be discussing today. Uh, but before we turn it over to Franklin and his presentation, I wanted to mention that uh, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A function uh, that you'll see at the down at the bottom corner of the um, of your screen. And uh, we'll get to those questions at the end of Franklin's presentation. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Franklin. Welcome. Thank you, Carl. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I want to start by saying that it's it's a real pleasure for me to be with you today. Um, I am seated at my piano. Um, you will not, you may not be able to see that, but I. This is going to be more of a lecture demonstration and and, and not really a lecture recital. If I had to play all three of the pieces in Opus One Hundred and Seventeen, that would be more than fifteen minutes, about sixteen seventeen, um, and would not leave me enough time to really get to this very complex um, procedure we see in, in Brahms's compositional style. I'll do my very best to make it as understandable and as, as plain and simple as possible. And I think um, um, it will help certainly with me playing the examples on the piano um, and so that you can hear um, the music and understand what is going on. Um, this lecture will, will explore then the use of motives as a unifying element, as we see in Johannes Brahms's three intimacy of Opus 117, three extraordinarily beautiful pieces. I will uh, also refer to another work by Brahms, namely his Quintet for Piano and Strings. And I will also touch on how Brahms's use of motive is very different than that of his peers such as uh, Franz Liszt. So my comments today will focus primarily on thematic and motivic events in these works. Um, it, for some time, Brahms was considered, considered to be a conservative composer. Um, in my mind, any conclusion that he was indeed conservative is ignorant of the complex manipulation of music, musical materials we see in his works. A turning point in the reception of Brahms's work and style was the publication of Arnold Schoenberg's famous essay uh, called Brahms the Progressive, in which Schoenberg sets out to prove that Brahms, the classicist, the academician, was indeed a great innovator in the realm of music language. Schoenberg, in fact, called him the great progressive. For historic context, it's also useful for us to consider briefly the principles which underpinned the romantic aesthetic ideals of the 19th century. These ideals were characterized by a pervasive emphasis on emotion, individualism, as well as the glorification of the past and the glorification of nature. Importantly, Romanticism emphasized intense emotion as an authentic source of aesthetic experience, and it placed new emphasis on such emotions as apprehension, fear, and awe. It considered folk art and ancient custom to be noble in status, but it also valued spontaneity, as we can see in the musical Impromptu, which became a popular form in the 19th century. Romanticism also assigned a high value to the achievements of heroic individualists 
and artists, whose examples it maintained would raise the quality of society. It also promoted the individual imagination as an important authority, an authority that allowed freedom from the classical notions of form, as we see in art and music. It is then within this environment of emancipation, individualism, and the new aesthetic ideals that composers in the 19th century explored new techniques of musical organization. Among these techniques is the new kind of transformation of themes that became an important tool in the construction of works of these composers. The dilemma for 19th century composers was how to construct large forms, such as sonata form, from very brief thematic materials. To resolve these challenges, composers had to rethink the traditional structural principles in the second part of the 19th century. Sonata form took on a wholly different significance with the development of thematic ideas and motives now assuming the role of highest structural components. If we think back to Mozart, Mozart essentially followed the established design of his time. Structural balance, very much like classical architecture, four measure phrases, and usually in sonata form, two contrast, contrasting themes that had no relation to each other. A further challenge for romantic composers, um, or let me first go back, um, Mozart's design and his, his compositional principles then were far different than the, the route the 19th century composers took because they didn't have these long phrases but short motives. As well, uh, um, romantic composers um, preferred shorter character pieces such as impromptos, mazurkas, waltzes, intermezzi, and so forth. Among the methods of musical organization used, most notably by Liszt and Wagner, is the one referred to as the process of metamorphosis or thematic transformation. Here, the character of themes is continually altered. This was particularly a Listian characteristic, and it was during Liszt's years at Weimar between 1841 and 1861 that Liszt brought to full fruition his revolutionary ideas about musical structure, and in particular, the transformation of themes. This technique was of supreme importance to Liszt, interested as he was in cyclic forms and the problem of rolling together several movements into one, as we see in his uh, monumental sonata in B minor. The term thematic transformation is, of course, built on the word theme, which can be described as a complete musical idea with its own identity from which the building blocks of a composition are generated. This identity is prescribed by a number of parameters, including timbre, dynamics, and articulation, all which affect the length and the contour and the characteristic sound of the idea. It then follows that transformation of this theme can target pitch, rhythm, and harmony. Liszt's procedure of thematic transformation in his sonata in B minor is remarkable in, it how, in how it transports themes to entirely different moods of expression. And yet, each time they are also underpinned with new harmonies and stated with different configurations. I will play for you now um, the uh, one of the principal themes from the sonata um, by Franz Liszt. And it's interesting to hear how he places the same melodic material in completely different uh, contexts, mood changes, um, and the also listen for the change in the rhythm of the segments as well. So the first statement of this theme is quite firm, aggressive and strong. And this is what it is. <laughs> That 
is the next statement of this theme is transformed to the one of the most gentle, most beautiful moments in the work. <laughs> And the next statement of the same theme takes on a, a sort of an anxious quality. And then at the very end of the sonata, Liszt uses this very same theme, but now clouded in, mis in mystery, nothing is very clear. The tonality is not clear and it is absolutely an absolute wonderful ending to the sonata. So though, um, it's fascinating how uh, the same thematic material changes and, and the mood changes, the harmonies help. On the, upper side of, on the opposite side of this spectrum, in the music of Brahms, we find the continuous development of brief motives, which was first, um, this was first described by Arnold Schoenberg as developing variation. The term developing variation is interesting in itself because development implies um, change. Variation also implies change. So this is a continuous um, process throughout uh, Brahms's works. Now, of course, um, what Schoenberg describes here, the use of motive, is nothing new to any of us. We see this um, in as far back as, as Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, most famous example of a motive that is pervasive and relentless in, in a piece of music is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And this is it. <laughs> So we can hear that is everywhere in that movement, um, and it drives the entire symphony, in fact. Um, Brahms's work reveals an operation of developing variation that is breathtaking. It is the underlying principle that governs entire movements and often entire works across movements, such as the quintet for piano and strings and, and also the three intermezzi, intermezzi of Opus 117. Here we see not only um, the use and the development of a motive within a single movement of a work, but it extends across the entire composition. In the case of the quintet, four movements, and then in 117, three intermezzi. Brahms took a different path then than Liszt, Schumann, or Wagner, and his own comments on the matter are revealing. In a conversation with a composer and critic, Richard Huberger, in 1896, he remarked, Schumann went the one way, Wagner the other, and I the third. Brahms was here referring to the fundamental contrast of attitude to the creative process. For example, in Schumann, it tends to be more intuitive and spontaneous. And in Brahms, it is more self-aware and a more constructed procedure. Um, for Brahms, the development of motives uh, was an important and conscious part of these methods, even though the inspiration originated from the unconscious. And I want to turn to the music of Brahms and show you, or I should say, I will let you hear the complex and ingenuous operation of the development of motive as it's revealed to us first in the quintet by Brahms. The quintet was originally composed as a string quintet with two cellos and then as a sonata for two pianos and then taking Clara Schumann's advice, Brahms recasted the piece, recast the piece as the quintet for piano and strings. This version is generally considered today as its most successful one. The world's greatest fascination lies in how Brahms integrates the tendencies of motivic development writing and expansive lyricism 
with a dramatically conceived whole. It is this integration that is perhaps the most striking and powerful one behind um, Brahms's uh, compositional technique. The main theme in the quintet will evolve into all of the thematic materials of all four movements of the work. I will play for you the main theme, and this is the way the piece starts, and then I will explain to you the, the characteristics found within this theme. <laughs> very very dramatic it's a minor key and so we have several characteristics we have this it's a fourth interval of fourth and then we have that's a third it's a filled in third you can hear you just think do re mi um and then we have this as well or this and then we have a half step which is important um throughout the entire work. We have first half step is here, the second one, and I'll play this just the opening again for you completely. Okay, so um, these are the qualities um, of that theme. And what is fascinating immediately after this arrest, This happens. And it sounds like a completely new material, but it's not. I'll do it slower. It's exactly. But it's just played. So here, Brahms really starts the development of the motive immediately, without hesitation. I mentioned to you just now the dominance of the semitone. It's this and this one. Um, early in the first movement, this semi semitone or half step um, is subjected to a process of variation until it becomes, in a very uh, dramatic way, the subsidiary theme, or we can call it a transition theme, of the of the first section of the of the movement, and. I will play for you the first um, development of this of the half step. I will play the two half steps again. First one. So it's these two notes, and then the second time. So all half steps, and then there it is. It's actually now on the pitch of the opening. And that becomes this subsidiary theme. Now, the ending of this theme is the opening theme. The second movement of the quintet um, seems at first um, very far removed from anything that we've heard. And um, it is a very beautiful, gentle theme. However, an in-depth examination shows a very close and continued relationship between the two, um, between the second, the, the slow theme, and a theme that we found in the first movement. It is not immediately obvious, but are revealed through very, very thoughtful and careful analysis. I'll play for you the um, slow movement theme. Very beautiful. Um, that sounds not, nothing like anything that I've played for you uh, from the first movement, but there's a theme in this first movement that sounds this way. And 
it's just changing the rhythm of those notes to a completely different rhythm. I'll play the first movement again. I hope that is clear. Um, the third movement um, is, a, is a scherzo and trio um, with three very distinct themes, each one um, resembling the transition theme that I talked about. That's the first movement uh, transition theme. And the, in the scherzo, this is the main uh, idea. You can hear this but it's fast and then it becomes the following and that's drawn out if I play it fast and Brahms also adds the following and then he uses the technique of inverting that theme and it becomes the following So um, the, the, the finale um, is predominantly based on the use of the, of this, of the half step or the semitone, and it's, it's everywhere in all of the material. I do want to turn now to um, the three intermezzi. Um, the most striking thing about the three works in Opus 117 is their simplicity, their beauty, they're intensely expressive, and at first hearing, we do not actually hear all of these uh, motives that are developed in each one and where they come from. Um, and this is the genius of Brahms, that he has this very complex um, inner workings in this style, but we don't hear those complicated things. All we hear is beauty and expression. Um, the first intermezzo opens with a very beautiful sweet lullaby-like theme that contains all of the uh, all of the motives and materials for the three um, movements. Uh, I just need to get my score. All right, so, uh, this is the main theme. <laughs> Very sweet lullaby. Um, I want to explain to you the elements here. We have this third coming down, and then we have this, and then the, the following. Those are the important um, elements of, of everything that we will hear next. Um, Brahms, um, in, in the first movement, he also not only developed the, the motors themselves, but he also put them, changed them harmonically and rhythmically and motivically as well. So um, I want to show you a few examples of how he changes or develops or, or, or add variation to the music. This is the first time we hear this. And then we hear this. And then next we hear this. So you can hear each time there's a rhythmic change in the last one, and then there are always harmonic um, shifts. At one of the one of the most fascinating moments in the in the first intermezzo is this section. That is going to become very important. Um, but first, I want to talk about these repeated notes. You can hear that repeat. I'm, 
playing it deliberately louder so you can, you can focus on that. Now those repeated E flats become important when, when we suddenly hear this. Here, there, I brought that out deliberately as well. But most fascinatingly, this becomes the principal material for the third intermezzo. I'll play that again. This is the third. So you can hear it clearly. Coming from that, um, there's also the, this kind of filled in third that I talked about, where we have is also heard here. I'll play that again. That's basically there. This is a fascinating moment in, in the first intermezzo because it has to do with the transition to the second intermezzo. Now I'll play for you the ending of the first intermezzo and you will hear the following. I'll bring out the middle voice. You could hear that. That almost makes us um, already be begin to hear right at the end of the first one, the second one. Now I'll play this again. And this is the second one. So you can clearly hear this. And it was heard actually with those pictures here. Same. Um, this, the second um, intermezzo also, I'll play this again. That, mallet, that motive then becomes the following. So a completely different um, um, statement of the same thematic material now placed in a more chordal fashion. Um, the third intermezzo is fascinating um, also in how Brahms um, changes um, the context each time of the main principal theme um, to highlight also for us the different um, harmonic contexts that develops not only the not really the melody itself but it is the expressive element to the music that he now develops this theme the first time it is placed within a harmonic context this is the harmony that he uses Second time. And the next one. And then we have. And the next one. Then, and finally, as you could hear in these examples, um, in all of the examples that I played for you today, um, 
You can hear how Brahms very ingeniously reconciled the principles of thematic transformation and with those of thematic development, all within the confines of a, a more traditional formal structure. Um, these works uh, show not only Brahms's solution to the challenges composers faced in the 19th century, but it also shows that he was very clearly influenced by the works of his peers and his predecessors. Most importantly, however, he chose a different path than say um, Liszt and Wagner, and he established his own style through a very unique application of the procedures of thematic transformation, but added to that the principles of developing variations, which are applied to very brief themes and motives. And in so doing, he created works that are unified to their fullest extent. Um, Brahms's compositional style today um, is far better understood. We all, you probably know the story that he struggled really hard to write his first symphony. It took him many years to complete. And at the premiere, he was asked, um, the, the, he was told it sounds like Beethoven. Um, and he was asked if it, if it was sounding like Beethoven and he, his answer to that was, any fool can hear that. Um, he really was inspired by Beethoven who was also a composer um, that used motive and the development of motives um, in a very ingenious way. Um, Beethoven also, of course, um, come from a tradition that, from the traditions that, that was Brahms shared and Brahms and Schumann particularly shared those same traditions. Um, that is my talk. I, I'm happy to uh, look at questions and if there are any. Thank you, Franklin. Um, questions for Franklin, if you could put those in the Q&A, if you have questions. All right, Franklin, we don't have any questions for you today. So thank you so much um, for the presentation. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Jeff. Jeff. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. I did have a question as to um, how the uh, thematic transformation plays out in the music today. I mean, you talked about how Schomburg said that um, Brahms was a great progressive. And it, I mean, can maybe can you point in, or just give me a name, I guess, of a couple other composers that are, um, that you can name that uses this kind of. Um, it's Wagner, for instance. I talked to him. I talked about Wagner a little bit, but in his operas, um, I didn't give examples of Wagner, but in his operas, he uses also a kind of thematic transformator, transformation. And he also, Wagner took it uh, in an added dimension where he links a, a melody or a theme with one of the characters in the opera. So often when the characters reappear on stage after they have not been on stage, the music will reflect that it's them, that's there. And, and that was called also a light motif, a motor that is linked to, to the actual um, um, characters in the opera. So the music was linked to the opera, to the characters, and the orchestra um, in Wagner became equally important. Um, no longer did the orchestra just play accompaniment to the singers, but the orchestra added dimension to the, to the drama, really. And and there's a there's a there's another element in Wagner is what he called Gesamtkunstwerk, or artworks that all come together. That he believed that music, drama, singing, acting, spectacle, everything has to come together in one big event. Um, other composers um, that that explored some of this Schumann, um, um, Mendelssohn to a some to some extent, but not not so much. Um, there were two camps 
in the 19th century. There were the camp of Schumann and Brahms, and then there was Liszt and the other ones, the romantic heroes. Um, Schumann and Brahms um, believed that music needed to be more sort of formal and not so much uh, driven by um, expansive emotions. So, Thank you. Thank you. I know every time I see one of these presentations, I, I tend to uh, appreciate a little more what I'm listening to, and I will be listening to that, that movement probably yeah. most of the day today. Um, I just know, want to add something. Um, the contemporary composers, um, um, a lot of contemporary composers are driven by um, this kind of organizational structure in their music. One of the movements um, that speaks most directly to this is minimalism. Um, composers use just bare minimum of ideas and then change it, but through metric shifts, dynamics, counterpoint, etc. My apologies, I have an anxious dog here. But um, now I just want to say again, thank you and thank everyone else for coming. And you know, though really subtle, I, I love those uh, rhythmic changes that comes with, the, with that, so. Uh, so I just want to remind everyone in two weeks, I know it's kind of been a little bit confusing for lunch and learn, it's once a month, but uh, in two weeks from today, uh, May 27th, we will uh, have uh, Laura Ewan and uh, we'll get adventurous together with Rivian. And again, Frank, uh, I thank you and I'm also looking forward to uh, hearing more from you. Thank you. Wishing everyone a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.